Okay. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I am going to make sure that we are recording at this moment. So thank you very much for being here today. Today we have a fantastic guest. Um, she's in London at the moment, Susanna Brown. Uh, among of her wonderful uh, achievements, achievements, she's a writer, she's a curator, and she's part of the, um, the Department of uh, Curatorial Photographs at the BNA in London. Welcome, Susanna. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's really lovely to see your face and yes. lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. Yes, I always start like finding out how do we meet, you know. Do you remember? It's a long time ago now, actually. I guess six, six years ago or thereabouts, we met in London at the very um, glitzy opening of the exhibition Horse Photographer of Style. That uh, you graciously curated and it was absolutely a divine experience to navigate in this fantastic BNA museum over 10 rooms that you curated one by one over 300 photographs so that is quite something and thank you so much for being here today and um, I wanted to begin to ask you um, when you start to create have a passion for photography Oh wow, that's a great question. Um, so actually I, I started out at the age of 18 uh, doing an art foundation course in London, a one year course, and I learned how to use the dark rooms to make my own pictures. I, I loved it, it was a very exciting year for me. And then I went on to university in Bristol um, and I studied the history of art. Uh, so it wasn't a practical course. Um, but I used to run the dark room uh, in the kind of student uh, housing, the, the hall of residence, and teach other students how to take pictures, how to work in the dark room, uh, have lovely little exhibitions about student works. And, and that was really the beginning uh, of my passion for photography. And, and I was very lucky um, when I left university and I, I started my master's degree in the history of museum collections um, back here in London. Uh, I was really, really lucky that I, I got um, an internship at the National Portrait Gallery in London, which has a fantastic collection of photography, huge world renowned collection. Um, and then from there, eventually, I, I got a job at the National Portrait Gallery and, and so on and so forth, and, and eventually ended up at the VA. But I've been working at the VA um, for 12 years now, uh, which feels like a long time, and it's, it's a, a great place to work. I'm actually furloughed at the moment uh, in London, so a lot of the VA colleagues have, have been furloughed because the museum is closed. Um, but we're you know, working on our personal projects and have the time now to do things like this uh, instead yeah. uh, so it's it's a strange time but it's also in some ways quite positive yeah. it's so great you know I, I, as um, many people know you know and um, we have an online gallery and one of our anchors is horse you know we are very privileged to be able to to sell it and we have a person in common you and i girl elfrin he has been my mentor and through him i have been touched by this uh, addiction to pictures, you know, and, and as he owned the Horse Be Horse estate, uh, maybe like what, 20 years ago, I believe, um, how did the BNA show interest in horse and why? Mm. Well, as you know, the, the VNA has um, almost a million photographs in its collection and has collected photography. Um, since the Victorian era, since, since the 1850s. Um, and we have a, a whole host of fantastic exhibitions. And um, Gert kind of came to us and said, or oh, perhaps you'd be interested in looking at the archive, exploring Horst's work, learning more about him. And then maybe, you know, there might be something there for an exhibition. Um, so that's what we did. You know, we, we visited um, the huge archive, meticulously organized, beautifully preserved. Um, really, for me as a curator, it's, it's rare uh, to see an individual collector who holds an archive that is so beautifully 
um, catalogued and stored to such a high level. Um, so it was a real joy to explore the contents and I guess it was very fast, very a very quick reaction that we could see this is you know the perfect subject for an exhibition because Horst worked for 60 years and his career was so rich you know we I suppose most of us think of him primarily as a fashion photographer wow. but there was so much else that he did he he was so um diverse and extraordinary in the the breadth of his work and so that for me as a curator was very exciting with the exhibition to think uh, you know, what else is there that we can show, um, perhaps the other sides of Horst as well, that we can present to the world. Um, those lesser known projects, those little known pictures, as well as the really um, famous, iconic images. Yeah. And with that, you produce a book too, you know, done by Risoli, I believe, you know, an amazing book that document the entire career of horse. You know, there are many, many books, as you can see on my back, of course, uh, but this one is just a really contemporary view of the entire career of horse as a young German guy that arrived in, my, in Paris to wanted to be an architect and work with Le Corbusier and then suddenly be picked by the fashion. He was gorgeous, handsome, and he became suddenly the toast of town, you know, in, in, in Paris. And the book, we're going to go through the pages of the book and uh, pieces of the exhibition and, and not a particular order for you because, you know, it's London time and here in Miami. But um, we're going to go through the exhibition images uh, at the beginning. The, this dramatic entrance of black and white that I remember very well, you know, it was just like take you to 10 rooms and over 300 words. Tell us about why black, why this dramatic? Well, I suppose for me, as a, as a curator, it's a lot of my work is about trying to transport people to a different world. You know, people that come to an exhibition, I want them to feel immersed in the era, in the time of, of that artist, um, not just in the pictures themselves. So I wanted that first room of the show to be very atmospheric and romantic. You know, this was a magical time in Horst's life as a, as you say, you know, a handsome young man. He arrived in Paris at the beginning of the 1930s, this most extraordinary era in the whole history of France, you know, this, this magical decade really before the war. And we wanted in that space to convey something of that dark kind of sexy feeling that Horst himself would have had, you know, coming to London, meeting uh, the, the grandly named Baron George Heunigen Hune, who became his mentor as well as his lover. This, this was a, a fantastically exciting time in Horst's career. And I, I also wanted that, that first room to be very dark because what a lot of people don't realize um, about Horst's early photographs from the, the 1930s in Paris is that almost every one of those pictures of the French couture uh, was photographed at night because that was the only time of day, uh, well, the only time uh, when these garments were available. So during the couture presentations in February and September, of course, in the daytime, the buyers and the clients would be at the couture houses. So the new styles, the new garments were only available to be photographed at the Vogue studio in the nighttime. How interesting. And, what a party it should be. I'm sure yeah. it was a party down there in the studio. <laughs> and it, to me, that was kind of fascinating to think and, and quite romantic to think of, of this kind of frenzy, of activity um, in the middle of the night at the Horst, uh, at the Vogue studio with Horst working away at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. with his favorite models and these beautiful, exquisite garments from the Paris couture houses. Yeah, I, he certainly, you know, was very much entitled of who he was, very secure, very handsome, and, and the ladies adore him, you know, so I, I, I guess all these amazing couture for the times, you know, Schiaparelli, Chanel, 
everybody went crazy with this very young, handsome man with great manners, you know, and lots of great attitude as well, you know, to photograph all their pieces. And I think he really um, formed lifelong friendships with some of those people, as you say, Chanel, Scaparelli, and the models as well that he worked with in Paris in the 30s, people like Lisa Fonsegreves and Lourdes, Lila Zelensky, these fantastic models became close friends. And um, when I was sort of researching Horse Life and his career, I spoke to some of the models who are still with us today um, about their memories of working with Horst. And, and it was very clear that they adored him. You know, they really um, cherished the, the friendships that they had with him. You know, because usually these photographers, after they shoot their couture and their campaign, they befriend the models, and then they ask them to be there to pose a nude or like Lisa Fonsa is here, you know, and, and Lisa on silk, one of the most iconic images, you know, how, you know, usually happen as a friendship in a way. And I think that was a particularly special friendship that, that when you mentioned with Lisa, who, you know, years after she met Horst, of course, she, she moved to New York and she married the photographer Irving Penn. Mm -hmm. but, but when Horst met her, she was still a, a dance teacher and Lisa came to the Vogue studio in Paris to have some, some test shots made to kind of try out as a model. And Horst took images of her, which of course were fantastic. Yeah. And that, that was the beginning of, of her enormous and hugely successful career. Yeah, yeah, yeah especially married in Irving Pan, you know, so amazing. You know, and then, you know, also not only the collaboration with the fashion models, but with the artists at the time, such as Dali. And, and this is a spectacular image. Tell us about these two, because they are just fascinating to me. I think that there was such a special moment in Paris in the 1930s when artists, particularly artists focused on, on sort of surrealism, were very engaged with other forms of culture, um, the magazine culture, the theatre, the ballet, there was really this in incredible symbiosis in the way that artists were working. So Dolly, um, having befriended Horst, um, they, they met through mutual friends, um, wanted to work with him. And it was an extraordinary relationship that they had and, and so many beautiful images that they worked on together. Um, I'm not sure which image, are you, you're looking at an image from the book at the moment, I think. I'm yes, just I'm looking, I'm looking, um, I'm looking and I'm surprised, perhaps I didn't share my screen with you. That's something that I'm looking, I'm looking at that amazing black and white images of Salvador, uh, Salvador oh. the Lee model with the, with the lobsters. Oh, fantastic. So that was one of, I think, the most special shoots um, with, with Horst and Dali. And that was the, the lobster costume for this extraordinary surreal fun house um, that Salvador Dali created for the dream of, uh, it was called the Dream of Venus, this fun house for the World's Fair in New York. And um, within this, this extraordinary space, um, he placed women swimming uh, in the lower rooms in enormous tanks of water in these extraordinary costumes. And, and here you see in the photograph that, that Horst has documented um, one such costume with, with lobsters and oyster shells or, or seashells of all kinds. And um, it's, it's certainly one of the more extreme pictures that Horst and you know, he, he's, he, he, they're extreme in a way for such a time, you know, uh, because he jumps into the color, you know, with such a vi vibrant images like the one that you have in the back at this moment. You know, Muriel, which is one of the favorite models that he, he photographed in a way. Muriel Maxwell, who you can see here. Yeah, this is one of my, my most favorite Horst images, which is why I put it here, from 1939, um, which was a cover for American Vogue. Of course, you know, Horst wasn't just working for, for French Vogue in the 30s. His, his pictures appeared in American Vogue and British Vogue as well. But what's so extraordinary about this picture, I think, is that it's, it's a perfect example of Horst's um, 
quick response to the new technologies of color photography, you know, this exciting, wonderful new language for magazine photographers is the, the language of color. And when Kodak uh, Film Company launches their Kodachrome film towards the end of the 1930s, Horst was very quick to uh, embrace the possibilities of this new technology and very quick to understand this new language. And, and a lot of photographers of his generation who had worked in black and white previously really struggled. Um, we might think of someone like Cecil Beaton. Yeah. And Vogue photographer. Yeah. I, I think in many ways he never really mastered uh, colour photography. It was too different, perhaps. The, the yeah. change was too great. Whereas for Horst, I think very quickly he was able to embrace colour and, and really understood, you know, the magic of colour photography at Vogue. Yeah. Then, you know, next to Muriel, and I'm going to guide you through the images, is this fantastic image of the cover that you select for your book. You know, I think over everything, this is really a fantastic image. And, and, and this is a collaboration that happened already in New York. That's right. Um, as part of my research, I, I spent quite a long time in the New York Vogue uh, and Vanity Fair archives, um, the, the Condé Nast kind of umbrella of archives. Um, and I found a lot of Horst's transparencies, um, the, the 10, 10 by eight inch color transparencies that he created uh, for these you know, extraordinary um, color pictures. But these didn't exist as um, finished photographs. They, they only existed as transparencies. And I really, really wanted to explore the possibility of creating photographs of the transparencies because um, they were quite badly damaged and, and quite difficult to show in an exhibition because they're fairly small and they need to be shown on a light box. So I really wanted the, the chance to make some new photographs. Um, so we worked very closely um, with Gert Elfring and the Horst Estate and the Condé Nast archive and a fantastic printer in New York um, to kind of resurrect those pictures, um, to retouch digitally the damaged transparencies and, and really try to bring those images back to life. And um, the result was some very large scale prints um, which we made for the exhibition. And, you know, the, that's the nature of photographing on a 10.8 transparency. The detail and the, the quality of that image is so beautiful. It's, it's so rich. There's so much information in a 10.8 transparency that you can blow it up to a huge size and it's still Perfect. perfectly, yeah. Absolutely, you know, the color, and, and as you say, you know, the embrace of, of the technology was really a man, uh, you know, a man that moved on times, you know, because he went from photograph royalty in Europe to photograph movie stars in, in America, and in black and white, and in color as well, and, and that giving such a level of, um, of, of social, you know, he was a social person. He was, have friends everywhere in the world, and that make him, I don't know, such a superstar for the mm. time. And I think he made friends very easily. You know, when, when you talk to the people who knew him, you realize what a great personality he was, how easy he was to get along with, how likable, how funny, um, but also quite a modest man, I think. And, and I think part of the reason he was so valuable later on in his life um, to Diana Vreeland at Vogue magazine in the 1960s was that he had this fantastic address book you know he had all these incredible friends and contacts around the world so when she sent him off to photograph artists and designers and royalty in their beautiful homes around the world these were people who were Horst's friends yeah. and, and intimate connections they they weren't just subjects for the camera they, they were people he really knew and I think that's why all of those pictures are so successful because you see that he's photographing people um, that he has a real human connection to that they're, they're not just another 
subject in front of the camera. I heard a story that the, 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 the you know, horse was getting you know, to be a bit of a, you know, older in a way, and, and Diana Brilliant at the helm of the magazine said, you know, the new thing is to photograph people at home, you know, at their houses. And he's sending around, as you say, to the most amazing palaces and houses, and he will stay for a week, for two. He will try with his boyfriend. The boyfriend will write the test. He will photograph. He will play it around. It was just quite fascinating, you know, to see a man just going around the world, just photographing people at home. Mm, and I think, as you touch on what made it quite special is that he did that with his partner, Valentine Lawford, that, that Lawford would write these beautiful texts, these, these really detailed accounts of these homes and gardens for the magazine alongside uh, horse photographs. And, and, you know, you can imagine them just having the time of their life traveling all over the world to the homes of, you know, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor in Paris and Cy Twombly in Rome and Roy Lichtenstein in the Hamptons. You know, they, they traveled everywhere. And like, I imagine it was a really, uh, you know, fun experience for them to, to have, have these kind of holidays all over the world. Absolutely. You know, we're going to go back because I think the world of horse can be looked at for in particular periods. You know, because there are some black and whites there's so now, you know, like uh, people recognize and talk about horse, of course, because the, the corset picture, you know, and then there is this amazing uh, portrait of Coco Chanel at her studio, which is one of the only ones that hang at this moment at the atelier in Paris. But, but the corset, is, it was bringing alive through Madonna, you know, video of Vogue. Yes. <laughs> And it's, it's such a timeless image, isn't it? The corset picture, the, the Mamboche corset or the main Boca corset, how, however you want to call it. Um, there's something about that picture that sort of transcends fashion and, and transcends time. And perhaps that's what appealed to Madonna about it, that it, it felt actually like quite a modern image when she recreated it for one of her, her music videos in the 80s yeah. even though it's a picture from 1939 yeah. and I think it's you know it's a special picture because it's mysterious you know we we don't know the full details of the model in this picture we only know her name today as Madame Bernon of course we don't see her face in the image and there's so much of it that is, is reminiscent of um, historic paintings of Aphrodite or Venus, you know, the, the goddess of love and beauty. Um, to my mind, you know, the, the corset image is Horst's own Venus. That's the aesthetic that he's trying to and create. It's last, and it's the last picture for what I understood he took before he left Paris. And, Paris and the lady, Madame, was crying and her eyes were very red. So he decided to photograph her from the back, you know, and, and I got to see that famous shell here in Miami, you know. So I, I, it's such an iconic picture because it's the goodbye from Paris before the Nazis invaded. Yeah, and I think for Horst throughout his whole life, and it was a very long life, that picture came to represent, um, as he himself said, it came to represent all that I was leaving behind. It was the very last picture that he took in Paris. And a few days later, he boarded um, the steamship, the Normandy, to sail from France to New York, um, sailing away from this, this magical time in his life, this beautiful world of 1930s Paris to, to an entirely new existence. And, and he wouldn't be able to even return to France for seven years after that picture was taken. So I, I think as an older man, um, that picture really for Horst became so representative of that, that special era, that decade, of the 1930s in Paris that was such a beautiful, magical, wonderful, romantic time yeah. in this young man's life. And then he got back and captured these amazing images of Coco Chanel, which are just absolutely gorgeous and reclining in this amazing chaise lounge and, and, and become Coco Chanel's favorite picture. Oh, for many years, this was 
Coco's favorite, favorite picture of herself. And she ordered dozens and dozens of prints um, of this photograph from Horst in the 1930s to give to, to friends and acquaintances. And he wouldn't accept any money for the prints because he, he felt so honored to have had the opportunity to photograph her. So um, instead, it's a very sweet story really. Um, he visited her at her apartment uh, one day and commented on a lot of the wonderful, lavish pieces of furniture in her home. And the very next day, a truck arrived at his apartment filled with all the pieces of furniture from Coco Chanel's collection, which he had admired the day before as a, a thank you gesture um, from the fashion designer to the photographer, which is very touching, I think. It's a beautiful story. He found himself, you know, in a way, and as you say, you know, he creates such a wonderful chemistry and friendship with all these people. And one of them was Carmen, which I actually have the incredible privilege to meet during the time of the exhibition and see this amazing, timeless woman being there, you know, speaking about horse and, um, and I'm passing images really through fast. I'm sorry about that. But um, you, to see her talk about her times with horse and how he discovered her in a way, right? Exactly. I mean, he absolutely did discover her. She was only 14 when she first worked with him and he really nurtured her career and encouraged her and supported her. Um, she was living with her mother um, in New York and I, th I think in a lot of ways perhaps Horst became kind of a father figure um, or even a grandfather to Carmen at such a tender young age and in, in the book um, we have this lovely interview with Carmen where, where she reminisces about their friendship and it really was a lifelong friendship and you know she spoke to him um, just days before he passed away and he was out in the swimming pool in his home. By this point, you're not able to see very well um, and very, very elderly. But, you know, he was happy and making the most of his life even at that point. And it was, it was very touching to talk to her about their 60, 70 year friendship. How, my maths isn't very good, however many years um, that they were friends and, and they supported each other, I think. And that's true of a lot of the models that Horst worked with. You know, he, he built these strong relationships with those models because of course, you know, it's, it's not um, all about the photographer. When we look at fashion photographs, we have to remember that this is a collaborative endeavor Absolutely. and it's as much about the work and the skill uh, of the model as the photographer actually and and so someone like Carmen who had trained as a dancer and had this beautiful balletic figure this great understanding of how to carry her her hands and her feet much like Lisa Fonson Greaves before her um, you know, that really appealed to Horst because for him, the hands and feet were always a very important part yeah. of his pictures. Yeah. And then, you know, he get to photograph 90 something covers that you guys put together in this amazing exhibition, you know, and, and there are all these incredible archives well preserved, you know, and they are pretty much the birth of this large fashion in colors of horse selection that we sell through our websites and, and, and we represent them in these limited editions and they're very carefully printed in Germany by the, girls, the, by the Horse Be Horse Estate. You know, how did, what's your, your reaction when you saw these amazing blow-ups being incredibly, almost like candy in color? <laughs> um. It was very exciting actually to, to create those new prints because you know it's it's rare with early or mid century uh, photography that you see prints on that scale. Um, they tend to be quite quite small images from the mid 20th century. Um, so it was a really exciting moment when those prints started being produced and we were able to kind of look at them and refine the process and so on. Um, really thrilling and, and we spent a long time thinking about the size of the prints you know trying to understand um 
what Horst himself would have wanted in terms of recreating those colour prints as, as new work. Um, and I found a fantastic image from one of Horst's early exhibitions that took place in New York. And um, the photographs were printed for that exhibition at over a metre high. So we knew that um, Horst really wanted to go big, you know, that he wanted to create images on a really large scale, much bigger than the scale of a magazine page. And so once we, we kind of understood that, we felt quite right about the decision to make the prints on a large scale for the exhibition. Well, in a way, yes. You know, he, he touched so many lives, you know, the, the story of him photographed Marlene Dietrich at his house in Oyster Bay and she arrived and he's not being on time. I don't know, she got a little bit upset and then she went a photograph in a particular way and then suddenly it's one of the most beautiful images of Marlene Dietrich. You know, and, and that, what do, you, what do you see when he's using such a simple elements, such as a chair and a natural light? What do you see in the beauty compared to the photographer? Now they, they have so much production around. I think that is the beauty of Horst's work, that he can take something very simple, very basic, and turn it into something fantastic and something very, very beautiful. And, and so much of his ability lies in his mastery of lighting. You know, and the, the Marlene Dietrich picture that, that you mentioned is a perfect example of that because she came in, you know, with a very strong idea, you must do the von Sternberg lighting. Well, German to German, no? It was yeah. a of a... <laughs> and, you know, she, she really knew what she wanted. Um, and of course, von Sternberg in, in all of her films had this very particular way of lighting the face with the, the butterfly lighting effect that created this beautiful, delicate kind of shadow under her nose. But Horst said, no, you know, I have my own way of lighting a portrait and I'm not going to do that. And he did something completely different that sort of flattened the image and, and softened the face. Absolutely. And as Horst, Horst himself said, um, and this is a, a quote from Horst, he said, all her wrinkles disappeared. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and he photographed it all, you know, it's, it's amazing to see, you know, for Noel Carver to, to, to then all these, you know, many, many other sets of Beth Davies and, and Marlene again. You know, he just went around the world charming people and photographed them in the way that he wanted to. Yes, and I think he always had a very clear vision of the picture that he wanted to create. You know, we, we know that from our research, looking at his sketchbooks and his preparatory drawings, that very often, and th this includes the Mamboche corset, um, very often Horst would draw the picture in advance of the sitting. And then sometimes he would have a day, even two days, to work on the lighting and to play with different lighting configurations before the photograph itself was taken. And so for, for him, you know, that, that process was quite uh, leisurely compared to a modern fashion shoot or a modern portrait shoot where time is money and time is very, very limited. Um, but, you know, Horst remains the master of light. And so for him, the idea of spending two days uh, setting up the lights for a single picture was not unusual. You know, that for him, the lighting is everything. That is what makes, makes the picture. And Horst has, has been called um, the, a sculptor in light. And I, I love that expression. And I think that's very fitting for him. That he's, very fitting one, absolutely. You know, he's carving uh, the figure with the lights in the studio. What was his relationship with Britain? Why was he so special to, for him, Britain? <clears throat> well, Horst, um, excuse me, Horst visited Britain on several occasions. And um, the first occasion was in 1930. And at that point he met um, Cecil Beaton, who had already been working for British Vogue for three years and was already quite well-established and well-known 
um, as a fashion and portrait photographer and an illustrator. Um, but I think from those early visits to Britain, what, what's clear from Horst's diaries and letters is that he very much admired the, the kind of proper style of the British, this quite old fashioned style, particularly the men uh, on the streets in London, in the city and Savile Row, um, in their hats and very smart suits. And, and he even tried himself um, on his return to Paris to, to emulate something of those, those kind of British fashions in the way he dressed, which I think is, is a nice kind of tribute um, to Britain, really. But he visited uh, on several occasions, and you know, because there were only three editions of Vogue magazine when Horst began working, um, there was the, the French, the American, and the British editions of Vogue, his pictures would often appear uh, in all three versions of Vogue. Not, not every picture, but, but a lot of the pictures did appear just as Cecil Beaton's pictures would sometimes appear in all three different versions of the magazine. Yeah, do you consider, you know, if we, if we go back to, to, to trying to put together the five greatest photographers, of this time, I think Horse is one, Cecil Beaton is the other one. And who do you consider the other three are? It's so hard. I put you on a spot, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think the work that Man Ray, together with Lee Miller, was doing in Paris in the 1930s was extraordinary. And that um, collaboration, that, that very close relationship that Lee Miller and Man Ray had was, was Spectacular. Ways, you know, um, not that different to the relationship that Horst had with George Honig and Hune um, as a, a kind of protege and the master uh, relationship. Um, I think Erwin Blumenfeld was making some of the most extraordinary, daring pictures in fashion at the end of the 1930s. And, you know, like Horst um, and many of their other contemporaries, he also fled from Europe for, for a new life and, and safety in New York and found, you know, a sanctuary and really um, a sense of family at Vogue in New York. I suppose the difference is that Erwin Blumenfeld never seemed very happy um, with his situation at Vogue, whereas I think Horst was very satisfied with his career there. And who else? It's, it's so hard to, to pick out individuals. Um, Clifford Coffin is a, a British photographer who, who I love, who I think perhaps has been a little bit overlooked. Um, of course, there weren't many women working for the fashion magazines at this time. Um, apart from Lee Miller and her collaborations with Man Ray, there weren't many others. And it wasn't really until later in the 1940s that we see um, names like Tony Frisell and other great female photographers um, coming to the fore. It was very much a man's world, I think, the, the world of fashion photography in the 90s. Yes, it was a very business oriented in a way. It was all about how to sell the, the garment, you know, the, the, the dress, the couture, the thing. You know, it's, it's important to understand after he does all these amazing color, 90 something co covers for Vogue and many other magazines. Uh, he goes and works for House and Garden. Um, he, does, um, he does his own trips. And then on his trips, he starts to explore with nature, you know, and, and that nature, you know, I love this particular portrait during his exhibition that is taken by, I believe, was Irving Penn? Yes, that's right. Yeah, beautiful portrait. Beautiful. Next to one of one of his um, nature studies, absolutely beautiful portrait. I don't know if I had. I can't remember now if it's in the book. I think it is. I'm it sure is. It, it is. is. It is in the book. And and I think it's just so amazing his posture and how and how he makes his body enlong through the posture. But at the same time, as you say, it's beautiful. As you say before, you know, he goes and does a, a close-ups of nature that is almost like like a story of, uh, of botanical. Mm. And I think it, that project that he called Patterns from Nature and the book in the 1940s that, that resulted from it 
was so extraordinary because it's such a break with everything he'd done before. It's so unexpected. Um, you know, these, these really forensic, detailed images of rocks and shells and minerals and plants and butterfly wings. It's totally different to anything that had come before that in Horst's career. But perhaps, you know, he'd, he'd reached a moment where he needed to step away from the world of fashion. That's, that's how I think about that project. It's him trying to take a breath and take some time for himself um, outside of that glamorous, glitzy, haute couture world. Um, to do something that, that mattered to him in a very personal way, I think. You were talking about fabrics, you know, and how beautiful these photographs become fabrics. I, actually, it's the first time I heard it, which is amazing. Yes, he, he created these beautifully sort of kaleidoscopic, fantastically modern collages using the photographs of shells and plants and so on. And they were actually reproduced and printed on silks and tinted with different pastel colours. You can imagine how absolutely stunning they must have been. Um, and, you know, sold commercially. And it's, it's a great example, I think, of Horst's understanding of that close relationship between art, photography, fashion and design. And, and in his book, Patterns from Nature, he, he writes that these images could um, be reprinted on all kinds of different textures and surfaces and have all kinds of different... Wallpaper, uh, everything. Do you remember the company that printed the name? I knew you were going to ask me that just then. And it's... it's I when knew you were going to send it to me when you remember. And I, I dug through all of their archives um, no, and now I can't remember the name. It'll come to me later. It'll that would be nice. You know, he went travel and, and there is a special trip that he document to, to, you know, the entire Iran and Mesopotamia, you know, all that fantastic close-ups of, of arches and how he played with natural light. It's just absolutely divine. How was the selection? Because there are somehow personal prints, more than they were not published. Uh, in magazines as a travel magazine, or they were? Well, some of his travel pictures were published. Um, the pictures from Persepolis were published in Vogue, um, and the, some of his pictures of the Kashkai tribes in Iran, uh, and some of his photographs from Israel. But there are a lot of travel pictures that were never published. Um, and as you say, we're totally personal. And you know, we, th we think of Horst really as a studio based photographer. You know, he's working with a controlled lighting in the studio with his large format camera on the tripod. It's a very static, um, controlled environment. But actually when we look at those travel pictures, you realize he's, he's just as comfortable and just as capable working outdoors with all of the unexpected um, problems that, that come with using natural light and being outside and people moving and so on. Um, and it's, it's another facet to his work that in the past I think has been quite overlooked. As you say, some, some of them were published but many w weren't ever really seen. As well as the mail notes, right? The mail notes, in a way, they were very private. They were not that publicized because they were very extreme at the time. Very, very. I mean, if you think, you know, 1953 was not a time when it was easy to be openly gay. It was, oh, I'm sorry, I just lost you for a minute there. Can you still hear me okay? We're here, we're here. Oh. Um, 1953 is when Horst undertook that beautiful project of the male nudes and that was not a moment when being homosexual publicly was an easy way to live you know and um, therefore it makes that project all the more kind of brave and extraordinary those pictures were exhibited at the time that Horst made them um, but as far as I know they were only exhibited in Paris um, but it's, you know, it was wonderful for us in the exhibition actually to be able to bring together 
a collection of those male nudes, um, which Horst reprinted much later in his life. Um, in canvas as well, right? They're the most beautiful. I, I have the privilege to own one in canvas. Um, they were printed late and some of them, and they were, you know, somewhere in the 50s, I believe, or 60s, where we they were just up and platinum print on canvas. Do you get to show some of the nudes of the exhibition, right? So we had um, one room dedicated to that project of male nudes. Um, and we were really, really lucky, actually, that um, Sir Elton John very generously lent all of, all of the pictures from his collection, beautiful platinum palladium prints. Um, and the way that Sir Elton John frames his pictures is really exquisite. Oh, um, so, of course, you know, every frame in silver and gold and, and handmade to, to really complement each of those photographs. So that was a very special room of the exhibition. Yeah, I, I do remember that one. And I, I remember it was just so mysterious and hard in a way, you know, to, to see all these bodies moving around. I, I was just very happy now, I remember. But, you know, the, he photographed always the male nudes, thinking about the Greek statues. You know, he have a great fascination with the Greek statues and, and it's just a, kind of like a truly inspiration. You know, there is, how many images do you think of nudes he took? It was only one model or there were various models? It's hard to tell in those male nudes because you really never see the, the faces. It was probably just one model, possibly two, but they were all taken in, in the same sitting, I think. So possibly it was just one model. Perhaps it was someone that, that Horst knew very well and, and therefore felt kind of comfortable um, photographing in this, this very intimate way. Perhaps it was someone who was a, a life model for art students and used to kind of posing nude uh, on a regular basis. I, I really don't know and it was something I was desperate to find out um, in my research. But where I, is that guy? <laughs> yeah, who is he and where is he now? You know, um, He must be quite elderly by now if he's still yeah. with us. But I love that, you know, I love that mystery as well. And as we were saying earlier about the, the corset photograph, the, the fact that we don't really know very much about that model kind of makes it all the more exciting and intriguing as a picture because it leaves us space for, for our own imagination. Absolutely. You know, and, and then, you know, when he started to do all these amazing photographs of interiors, you know, and we can see in the book that you have Truman Capote, uh, uh, amazing portraits, and, and, and you know, even Warhol and uh, the, um, Diana Brillan and Diane von Fustenberg, and anybody who was anybody, you know, was photographed by him at home, you know. And it, it is it's an impact on his style because at the moment people wanted to keep a bit their life private. And do you think that was? the repercussion of the, the insinuation of Diana Breland to send him to photograph people at home and create that sort of trend of magazines and modernize house and garden. She certainly, Breland, was a, a huge force in terms of modernizing publishing as a whole. Um, when she worked at Harper's Bazaar, then when she moved to Vogue and so on later in her career, you know, she, she was all about what, what's modern and what's new. And yes, I think there was, you know, that excitement of looking, if, if you're reading a magazine, looking at the photographs of someone in their own home, that you feel like you're entering a very kind of privileged private environment. And particularly in the way that Horst photographed those people in their homes, often, he would use the device of photographing kind of through uh, an arrangement of flowers or photographing someone kind of reclining in the corner of a couch or a sofa so that you very much feel when you look at those pictures like you are just stepping into that room, like you're an invited guest into that person's home and you're seeing them, you know, at ease, entertaining kind of in their natural world. And, and that was something still quite unusual, as you say, quite modern for magazines, but I think something that readers 
found very kind of exciting, very illuminating. And of course, the owners of these homes loved the opportunity often to show off the fantastic interiors, their beautiful art collections, their splendid gardens. You know, these are very special properties and quite rightly, you know, people are very proud of them. No, we can see that he goes from like royalty to Yves Saint Laurent to Cy Tombly uh, to, to all these fantastic ladies of the time, Marella Agnelli, which are fantastic, the Rockefellers. But then it goes and, and somehow, the, in a way, capture the essence of their life, as you say, in a very casual way, you know. I think in, in a way it's the beginning of social gossip, you know, public, you know, and, and print, because uh, people, they become a little bit of an aspirational, don't you think, you know, to see, to live in that way. Absolutely. And, and that is the nature of all magazines. It's, it's aspirational living. You know, there are very few people who read a magazine like Vogue who can afford every single beautiful garment that is being presented on the pages. And likewise, there are very few people who read House and Garden or other interior magazines who live in such splendor. So you're right, it's all about aspirational living. It's all about selling um, a dream. You know, as Irving Penn himself said about his work for Vogue, um, that famous quotation, I always thought we were selling dreams not clothes and and that's what magazines are all about you know you don't want to see real people in their rather boring you know gray houses you you want to see magnificence and splendor and treasures in in people's homes and and that was what horst brought to the readers in abundance and i think the combination of horst's photographs with the very evocative descriptive beautiful text by Valentine Lawford um, was really kind of a, a perfect combination and that's why um, they kept on producing these images and were sent to such extraordinary destinations all over the world because um, th they were so successful at, at creating this sort of sense of escapism in the magazine. No, I, I think it's, it's a fantastic uh, life that he had. You know, one of my favorite pictures is the Cy Tombly's 1966, because that was the year that I was born. And just to see how this American live in Italy and this palazzo, and how he, in a way, let horse pretty much command the operation of the entire fashion show, you know. And, and that, for me, resumed, you know, in a way, the grandeur of art being photographed by an artist and documented in a way you know through his uh, through his eye i love that that Cy Twombly series and that you realize you know how he he created a home that was almost like stepping into one of his paintings you know it's very sparse that home although it's a italian palazzo it's really stripped back to an incredibly sort of minimal architecture and the tones that he uses to decorate the house are very much the same palette of colors that, that he used in his own paintings. Um, so for me, I think that's, that's one of my favorites of all of those projects that, that Horst did of, of photographing artists in their homes. I love the Andy Warhol pictures as well from the factory um, with the enormous Great Dane um, dog, the, the stuffed dog. Um, yes, yeah, very strange and quite surreal as, as you would expect, I suppose. Um, but it's, it's such a glimpse into um, the lives of really the most extraordinary personalities of the 20th century. And, and if you think about all the homes and all the people that, that Horst photographed, it's extraordinary that it, it, it spans such a cross section of culture and society. You know, it's, it's not just artists or just fashion designers or movie stars. It's also, you know, royalty and aristocracy. Um, it's, it's really a who's who um, of the 20th century, which is astounding. And for me, you know, it was very touching um, 
in my research for the exhibition and the book to read the letters that these people had sent to him and you know writing very warmly they would say you know we we were so honored to have you in our house or you know, we so enjoyed having you to stay and you really see that it's it's a friendship that he has with these extraordinary people he's he's not just a, a strange visitor these these are his dear friends and you know it was fantastic to see those letters and read what the experience of being photographed meant to, to those people. Well, we wanted to say thank you very much for taking the time. You know, I know we can talk hours about this. Uh, uh, you are as passionate as I am from this particular man who really changed the story through his camera and, and fashion and in art. And we are very lucky to, to have him in the, at the Art Design Project. And, um, you know, I wanted to revise this exhibition that you did because certainly it was a monumental exhibition and I want to invite everybody to buy your book because it's just absolutely the best document at the moment um, through the years of the careers, of course, and they have beautiful images. And, and thank you so much, Suzanne. I really appreciate that, the moment that you take for us. No, it's my great pleasure. And as you know, I could talk all day about Horst and it's, it's lovely to see your face and talk to you. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Please don't forget to send me the name of the person, the company who, who produced these fabrics. Oh, I'm very curious. I will. It's getting late in London and my brain is working very slowly now. Yeah, um, but I, but will. I know you will find it. <laughs> I will. I will. I thank you many kisses. Thank you so much. Take care. All my best. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.